Hi, everybody. This is Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal. Welcome to today's episode of the Search Engine Journal show. Today, I have Ryan Kushner, um, Circus Circus Maximus Branding. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? It's going great, man. How are you? Good, good. How's everything down in Austin? We are in that very short window of livable. And then in about two weeks, it will become so hot that you can't go outside. So, perfect. Here, what comes summertime to 50 degrees and everyone's wearing parkas and scarves. Yeah. It is officially going to be sore throat season next week. Yeah. They, the Texans love, I mean, I moved here two and a half years ago and true Texans, it's like, they love it. And and for everyone else, I'm like, it's like 109, guys. It's like, yeah, no. we got to go inside. <laughs> yes. Exactly. exactly. Uh, so those for those of you who are listening and not viewing, you may see that Ryan is, is wearing a very Texan-oriented cowboy hat at the moment. Um, and I think, if anything, that exemplifies what we've been discussing before starting the show. Um, in the world of SEO and even search marketing, Content marketing, understanding the customer and the customer's needs, desires, wants, and lifestyle has become almost as important as developing your brand's lifestyle, um, identity, and everything else. So we invited Ryan on the show today really to talk about how they work with brands at Circus Maximus to, to develop that and also at the same time utilizing what's called the Ikigai system. Um, Ryan, how about if you just introduce yourself real quick and then we can sure. get into the system a bit. Sure, sure. Ryan Kutcher, uh, founder of Circus Maximus. I've uh, been working in the business for man, almost 20 years yeah. and yeah. Well, started Circus Maximus 10 years ago specifically to work on um, kind of what I felt was like a, a new breed of client, you know, kind of the direct to consumer. And then we've, we've grown and metastasized or maybe evolved as a, as a polite word. Um, to working with all kinds of brands, Fortune 500 brands, independent startups, um, and helping them with their branding, brand identity, brand narrative. Our, our tagline as an agency is we help brands get their story straight and tell them interestingly. So those are the kinds of things that we do. I find that to be incredibly valuable. I mean, it's always been valuable, but incredibly more valuable now in the world of uh, reels, digital retarding i'll go to a website where i intend to maybe buy a hat or buy some pants or a shirt or a carpet next thing i know i'm bombarded with ads of companies that are selling what seems to be almost the exact same product and or bring in influencers to pitch a very similar product over and over and over and over and over again sometimes even after i purchase the product um so in the world of digital marketing right now, what are some ways that you work with brands to develop that narrative and have them really cut through the noise, become memorable and develop that character? So it's a process. You know, you mentioned the Ikigai thing. And I, I think for, for listeners that don't know what that is, it's, it's, it's kind of like um, it's a Japanese philosophy about finding purpose. It's really for human individuals, human people. Um, and it asks four questions for, or four provocations, which is what, what am I passionate about? Um, what am I good at? What does the world need and why should they pay for it? And that, that like discovering that and kind of applying brand building processes through that lens is, is kind of how we started to take shape about, you know, the way that we help brands get interesting and tell their story straight. And I think um, through, through, through that journey or that process, you know, you sort of rattled off a bunch of different mechanics for the ways that brands can tell their stories. Um, and I think we can, it's very easy to get lost in those, right? Like any one of us that goes on Instagram, if your Instagram is like mine, you go on there, I've got a hundred different ad agencies that are targeting me with like, here's how you're going to build your funnel in three hours so you can have a hundred million dollars a month. All the, 
you just got to, you got to, and they have all these different ways to kind of exploit the mechanics. We sort of take a step back for brands to maybe think a little bit more um, narratively about what the story they're trying to tell is. And, and then think about how you're applying that to the customer journey um, rather than like tactics first, which just makes your head explode these days. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back after this brief message from our sponsor. Stay with us. How is AI impacting content and SEO? How will chat GPT affect your world? Get answers, insights, and stay up to date on the ever-evolving world of search. Subscribe today at searchenginejournal.com slash subscribe. Now back to our show. So what's a good example of a way to get started with helping so, you develop that? Really, like the first question that we ask is, is, is the why. You know, mm-hmm. why is your brand doing what it's doing? What is the brand purpose? Um, and, and that answer is not to make money or to increase revenue by a quarter, 3%. It's not a business goal. It's a human mission. Um, and, and that's usually where we'd like to start because that's, that's sort of the straw that stirs the drink for, for the brand storytelling. Um, and every brand has to answer it in their own way. Um, but, and it's, it's, it's usually pr- pretty challenging, but like by answering sort of that, in, in addition to a couple other questions, um, I think what you create is a is a shared understanding among the founder, if he's or she is still around, or at least the CEO, and that that vision is internally really well understood and articulated. And then that gives all of the people that are maybe your you know your head of sales, your chief of technology, your uh, your whole C suite team, your chief of operations, your brand directors. If everyone could kind of answer those questions the same way, or at least have an understanding of how the brand wants to answer those questions. They, 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 they start to work for that idea or that narrative. And then that helps them do their job better and hopefully helps them tell their story better, tell the story better. Um, so there's kind of an internal role of answering these questions and having this shared narrative and there's an external role. Um, so, so that's where it really starts. It for us is kind of with purpose. And sometimes our brands already have that, but if, if we're starting from total scratch, that's really where we like to start the conversation. We recently had some experts working on years, and what we do pretty much everything. What is our mission? Not what's our mission statement? It's on the about us page. What is our mission? And I think that, you know, four responses. Yeah, so we'll see from an ownership perspective that some of those responses were either polar opposites, completely in different directions, parallels to a degree, and then there was some sort of some overlap. And that was a really interesting place to be. Sometimes, sometimes as a business owner or an executive, you assume that the entire company gets the mission. And what you said is human mission, right? So, you know, one of the things that are lacking in the workplace or that's been lacking in the workplace for the past 20, 30 years is purpose what gets you up in the morning, right? If you look at the Japanese Ikigai system and the Koretsu thing, what, what gets me up in the morning? I'm getting up to work for Mitsubishi. My father worked for Mitsubishi. My grandfather worked for Mitsubishi. Before it was formed, we were part of the family. We play baseball on the weekends for the Mitsubishi baseball team. We're a fan of this. We drive Mitsubishis. It's an incredible lifestyle, like an incredible like loyalty to the company that you're working for. So... In our case, it was like really eye-opening to see that. Um, so there's a human mission come in um, into the passion point, or is that kind of a next step? Yeah, and it, you know, I think there's a slight nuance I think between what mission you're on and what's your mission statement. But like, you know, kind of like you said, it's, it's like the ikigai thing is like what's getting you out of bed, and. And it's not like, well, I have to pay rent. We all know we got to pay rent, right? So it's not about making the money. It's more like, well, I'm on a mission to uh, further human creativity. Or, you know, I'm on a, you know, our brand is here to democratize healthcare. I don't know what, what it could be, right? But those are a couple examples that, to your point, where it's like, 
yeah, I'm getting up every day because I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. Um, it should feel interesting or inspiring. I'm, and it doesn't have, I mean, sometimes it's dry, right? Like we're on a mission to make sure to increase the efficiency of the global food supply. Right. I'm into that, right? So it should draw people in um, and, and hopefully get them excited or conversely communicate like, oh, cool, not for me. Exactly, exactly. Which really helps from a recruitment perspective as well. Yeah, so I mean, really wants to be part of like, make sure that, boom, boom. you're going to attract yeah. the right people. Because they're working for that. They're not working for you, right? And so I think uh -huh. it, the value of it is like, you know, I was talking with, this is a couple months ago, and I was talking with the founder of Row. Well, I don't know. Maybe you'll delete that later. I think he'd be fine to, 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 to be referenced here. But he was, I, I had asked him, like, what's going on? How's it going? Like, they've had this incredible growth and, and, and tremendous success. And I was like, what's, what's been the most interesting thing that you guys have been working on lately? And that was his answer. We did like a six months exhaustive soul searching process to get to the heart of why we, why we do this. Mm. And, and he said it was the most valuable exercise that I could do because I have all these super talented people, but I realized like the vision hadn't been, the mission hadn't been articulated. And as soon as we landed on it, everyone knew what to do. And everyone knew if they wanted to do it with us. And it became, it's, it's a money saver because everyone's super clear on what they're supposed to be doing. Like you said, everyone's motivated, which is an amazing thing to be able to do to any team uh, of any size. And then you get the best out of the people that you've hired because they're not wasting time, effort, energy, asking the same questions, wondering what they should be doing. They're sort of like, everyone's kind of rowing the same direction. Um, and so, uh, but, that's why I'm going to start there, you know? Yeah. So in a similar, but different industry, um, well, s fairly similar one company that came right out of the box with that defined recently was Mark Cuban's cost plus drugs, like right out of the box. We, even yeah. their, their, their description well, their title tag, when you search for them on, 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 on Google, says homepage of Mark Cuban cost plus drug, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but then afterwards, the description says provide safe, affordable medicine or medication with transparent, low prices to normal people, to people, to people who can afford it, right? They came right out of the gate with that statement, blew up. The site's terrible. UX is terrible. Everything else, that would probably be fixed over time. But the ability, and there's also there's also the influence, right? But um, the ability to come out of the gate with something that people can instantly connect to, that can instantly say, "Hey, I'm helping. Hey, let me share this. Not th not just let me buy, but let me share this with my friends and family because this can actually help the quality of their lives." Is something that you can't buy from a from a well, I guess this was probably bought from a branding campaign, but you can't necessarily put that into a, a 15 second TV spot, right? And have that happen. And I think that can sometimes be the power no. of defining that brand and that brand. Well, and I think, look, I don't know Mark Cuban, but I think what people like Mark Cuban that are really successful entrepreneurs understand is that you start with the mission and then you build the company around it. You don't start with the company and then build a mission backwards. And, and the thing about having that mission defined is, like I just said, it's like the mission comes first and then you build the company to achieve that mission. When you have the mission fully defined, the people that you need to help you build that company come to you because they're attracted to the mission. And some of those people are customers. So that's the power of the mission. So is the mission the only component of the passion point or is there anything else that's also defined that's under the, that's that's part of that passion being the first doing the so, circle um you know like the the four Venn diagram overlap 
really bucket i call them like the buckets of questions because we, we we tend to ask a couple more but it's like that's that's like what what am i good at or you know what what do i what do i want to do and then the other one is this for the second one that we ask is uh starts with why does your brain exist then it's like uh why why does anyone care because you have to you can be on a mission and that you're really passionate about but we live in the world of economics and if you can't trade that for value you don't have a business um so it's really the interplay of these of these four questions in Ikigai. We kind of organize them one, two, three, four. Um, but that's that's sort of where the second one starts to take place, and that's and that's where we talk about like the voice of the consumer. Um, okay. uh, what does the world need, or, or or why should anyone care? Kind of a, a thing. If if you're if you're fulfilling a need that doesn't exist. You don't have a business, you have a hobby, you know, and, uh, we all work in the world of business. So you've got to figure that out. So what's a good way to get started with that then? Like what are some tumor research? I think there's a tumor research is, is sort of, um, insights. A lot of times, uh, it's gut checking, you know, Many, many entrepreneurs just have a gut for it. You know, maybe there's, um, you've needed something in your life that does exist. Um, and so you sort of start to get a sense, but yeah, I would say there's consumer research. There's, um, first party research to sort of get a sense of like what, you know, if this existed, would you pay for it? Um, there, it's a little bit of the answer, right? Cause like there's the famous quote. Henry Ford, if I asked what consumers wanted, they would have said a faster horse. But you have to identify like sort of a, a white space or an opportunity or a problem that, that hasn't been solved uh, in a specific way for, for, for people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the work that you do in that sort of section, like identifying the need. Excellent. The why would people pay for? How do we? You broke okay. a little. Yeah, I know it's kind of lagging today. That's just twenty twenty three happened to us. Been a weird year. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. It looks like it's back. So. And what about the one of the one of the final circles, right? And the, and these four circles here is paying for it. Um, mm-hmm. What you can be paid for. So as a company, how does this all fit in to the ability to sell or the ability to earn revenue from pinpointing passion, mission, profession, and vocation? Not just from a company, but from a staffing perspective as well. Yeah, I mean that's the economics part, you know. Like that's where you get into kind of price models and and and, and um, do people really want to exchange value here? Um, we've identified a need, but maybe they're getting that need filled by someone else that you know you didn't think of a competitor, or maybe even just a completely different. Uh, like that's kind of. Think Uber or Lyft or something like that as an example. Like, well, taxis existed, um, but so they're not paying you for transportation. What are they paying you for? They're paying you for the convenience, right? So you can get into an Uber and you have this magical experience where it all happened through my phone. Here's the car. I get in. I go where I'm going. I get out. There's no cash. There's no swiping. There's no weird smell. So really, I mean, I think that's identifying like, why, why would, why would someone pay you for this? And it's like, cause the experience of that was tremendous, tremendously better or something like that. So 
who kind of refines exactly what it is that you're all about. So that's interesting because, um, so that industry, there, there's two companies that come to mind, Uber and Lyft. What would you say is the key differentiation from a, in, in brand mission or branding between those two companies? So Uber sort of was like, just off the cuff, Uber was like for people that want to feel like badasses and cool and smart. And Lyft right. was about, kind of had more of a, a community mission to it where it's like, Hey, this is just a, a more economical, a more ecological a sort of a friendlier way to travel. Uh, there's a sense of community to it. Even you can kind of read that in the name. There's Uber or better, or whatever is Uber better. Um, and then Lyft is just friendlier, the colors, all that stuff, the kind of the feeling, the vibe. Um, if you've interacted with either of those companies, you might have had experiences that kind of reflect those two personas. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, there's there's usually an alternative. There's a, there's always a Pepsi to a Coke. You know, uh, you're going to get imitated quickly if you're an innovator. That's a classic imi innovators to allow. But, but so those are the, the two. And um, you might argue as well, there's components to it of availability, like Uber had market share first. So, you know, right. in the early days, you might be in, a, you know, Columbus, Ohio, you know, 2000, whatever, 11, and lift there yet. So they had a competitive advantage, things of that nature. Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because, um, first of all, the first time I ever used Uber, it was only, it was only town cars and black cars. Right, it was in San Francisco, uh, and you could not do a normal car; it had to be a black car service. So there was that you were an upper echelon, you were above taxis. Right? Oh, I'm not going to get a taxi. I'm ca I'm calling an Uber. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. two, two, they also changed their logo to be more inclusive because their logo just used to be a U. It used to be all about you. Now it's all about us. Now it's a circle. Right? Yeah. So whereas Lyft has never changed. I don't think they've made all altered their logo but it's always been rounded it's always been inclusive i think it's always been lowercase it's kind of weekly it's pink it's bright it's inviting yeah Uber is all those things that you mentioned and you know but in recent very recent times you know both both companies have had cef changes but you know the internal culture of, of Uber became almost as famous as the brand itself you know with travis kalanick, kalanick or whatever so there's a point at which, right, all, all brands are a reflection of their founder in some way, hmm. um, which is, which is kind of why that ikigai thing, which is generally applied to people, feels particularly relevant for brands where I think they're just a little bit more accessible to think of in, in terms of the way that we think uh, of people. And in general, as the, as the human species relate more to things that are like ourselves people um and kind of these inanimate objects and that's that's another reason why we like the ikigai approach is kind of it's a, it's a human modeling system when applied to businesses it brings a level of depth and personality because as we go through those kind of four phases there's times when we're really identifying what's your what's your tone of voice what's your persona you know, like uh, things that you would really describe a person with. We're clearly articulating and identifying for brands. Um, what are your core values? You know, what are the things that you, as a business, a brand, what are the non-negotiable values that you all hold dear? Um, that's a really important kind of phase uh, of the process, I think, that uh, like the mission Sort of helps guide decision making. Should we do this? Should we not do this? Well, does it hold up to our value? Should we hire that person? Should we partner with that influencer? I'd like, you know, right now, a partner with an influencer, and certainly that's been in the headlines. Um, so, but if their values are inclusivity, it's the right thing to do. So, you know, kind of dancing around a bunch of different topics here a little bit, but like, um, through that EP guy process and kind of the humanization of, of the thought process, uh, I think it helps bring the brands to life. Also, what's the alternative to Bud Light? Miller Light, same company. 
Well, are well, you got Impath, and then you have Miller Lite is uh, one South African brewing and one is uh, Belgian, right? I'm not 100 percent sure, but I do believe that they have properties. Um. No. Anyway, anyway, so another company that came to mind while you were talking was uh, so ten years ago I moved to California from the East Coast and I was immediately introduced to an Out Burger, right? So, In and Out Burger. Um, let me read their mission statement. Yeah, providing the freshest, highest quality foods and services for a profit and a spotless, sparkling environment whereby the customer is our most important asset. So I find this to be interesting in a couple of ways, especially when it comes back down to the what, how to pay, would you pay for it, everything else. Um, one, in and out is by far the cheapest, especially now, um, burger outlet there is that has a drive through yeah. And at the same time, the freshest. The caveat being the lines are always so long, not even the one next to LAX, even the ones like in, in any town. And the in and out is the best one. God. People are waiting, waiting. You you will wait 30 minutes. In this society, in this day and age, someone will wait 30 minutes to get an out in and out burger, which is which is incredible. It's incredible. It's a little bit cheaper than, than the competition. It's, the fries aren't that so which makes you want to put cheese on top or something like that suck. sorry dude. they yeah the fries yeah. Suck. but they have it down for some minutes of fries i don't know why but they have it down they think the entire thing down from a brand new perspective to the point where in the window people buy t-shirts that say yeah. in and out they, they will yeah. get the hats they give out the hats they get stickers kits it's pretty amazing it's pretty amazing it's a lifestyle it's a brand yeah dude. In and out, and and talk about that mission statement can sort of includes a value. You know, I mean, I think the furthest east that In and Out was until recent memory, maybe three, four years, five years ago, was Las Vegas. Now there's one in my hometown here in yeah. Cedar Park, Texas. There's not a big line in front of that one, but that. Because, and the reason that was, and maybe this is where you were going to go with this, was like, they got the, they have meat vendors that they have had established relationships with. They don't freeze their beef. So that beef has to be able to get to all of their locations fresh to live up to that mission statement. And that effectively created like a geo targeted footprint that they couldn't go beyond now they've changed some of their vendor relationship i don't know if that's changed the quality but all of that contributed to those lines it was like you can only get it there it had this kind of exclusivity and it was like, i gotta try it so it became this thing um i am not sure that they're as successful in texas as they have historically been in in california but i know that the lines are hmm. interesting are you loyalty this is Pete Terry. What's that? Probably, well, unless you're from Texas, you probably don't know Pete Terry's. But there's a, there's a local chain here in Texas called Pete Terry's. It's very similar to it. Got but it. it's Texas. And it's like, Pete Terry's has the same line, right? But in and out, not so much. Interesting. Interesting. So you are actually quick in and out then but there's no line um yeah. getting back to well are there any brands that you've worked with at circus maximus that you that that you utilize as a, a flagship example of applying this ikigai concept i think we i think we did a pretty good job of this with roman or Ro, now Ro. um you know, some of the brands, like where we really get to dig in with this is, is in some of the startup brands that we've worked worked with. That's like Row, or we, we created a brand during the pandemic called Ongo, um, which was kind of a rebrand of they they offer COVID testing, fast um, rapid test. And we really built that brand 
in that space, um, everyone was kind of selling a test based on speed and accuracy, which were technical, you know, kind of components to a, a COVID rapid test. Right. And we, through our process, what we really built the brand around was um, freedom and the joy of connection. Because we sort of said like, well, you know, what are you all about? Are you, we're not, we're not all about accuracy. We're all about giving people the green light to get back to the bar mitzvah, grandpa's birthday, seeing your friends at dinner, the, the green light to get back to all the important moments in life. And by having a very fast and effective rapid test, you could do that. So we sort of changed the, changed the narrative there a little bit. Um, it influenced the way that we designed the packaging. We made it very sort of fun, inviting, uh, very bright and colorful. Everything else is kind of blue and has like weird chemistry set looking designs on there. Um, and, you know, we went to number one in the Amazon store. We made approachable and fun videos that walked you through how to do the nasal swab. The nasal swab was like the least convenient, most painful, sucky part, you know, of, of the COVID test. And we sort of took some of the edge off by creating a fun and approachable walkthrough that you and your family could all kind of do and follow. And it wasn't cold and weird and Fouch wasn't shouting at me. It was, it was very much like this kind of approachable, hey, back to this, we get to that fun thing that we really have been looking forward to because we're going to, you know, we're going to get the results. So it just very much changed like the, the tenor and tone of, of the way that we were talking about COVID and what we wanted out of life. And that was the foundation of that brand. Awesome. Yeah. I, it even sounds less clinical than everything else that was on the market. Plus the video. Yeah. The, the, the name of the, of the, the business, you know, not to disparage that, but whatever, but it sounded kind of like uh, your average biotech kind of firm. We changed it to OnGo. It was like ongoing. You know, we want, <laughs> we want all these things, all these activities, all the stuff that we love, all the socialization, all of that to be ongoing. So it was OnGo. Awesome. Love it. Um, so what, what's another way that our listeners can apply some of these concepts to their website, their product pages, tell a story, um, even to maybe some of the blog that they may be doing? Yeah, I think, you know, when we talk about kind of the component about, you know, what, what does the world need? Maybe you could, you could also think about the question, like, what does your customer need? Um, what your customer want and when i think of content marketing i'm usually thinking of like what what does my customer want what is their sort of desired state of being thinking backwards from that what's stopping them from getting that and then i will usually write content or i'll have chat gpt write content uh that that helps resolve those barriers and, and that's the way that I think about like where does the content marketing kind of fall out of this stuff? Um, so in that kind of phase, you know, we've really identified what the customer wants. Like, um, you know, I, I want to go to uh, a bar mitzvah, but uh, I've got, you know, I, you know, I don't have enough COVID tests. It's like, right, well, how to how to have a how to have a uh, a Zoom bar mitzvah that feels just as good as the real thing. There's a little piece, there's a content article that you could write. So kind of answering those questions or, or um, asking those, those questions that are a barrier to what the consumer wants and then resolving them through your content marketing tends to be a pretty good way to go. Good for SEO as well, because that's what people are, that's, that's how people search. I think what they're looking for solutions to problems. Yeah. As well. You get the zit off my face or, you know, how do I get rid of a zit in, in, before a date or whatever, you know, so maybe you're a personal care brand and, and, and you, and you deal with that stuff. You might, you might offer, it might not be the salute, you know, it's Octi, Oxy pads, but you know, you know, there's another solution that you could offer because you're in the service of helping people feel confident and look good. Ultimately. 
So maybe that's a way that you help your consumer do that. That goes a little bit beyond your your product, but it's still in line with your mission and then makes for great content marketing. So you start to see how like, oh, it's kind of this ecosystem that all of these the questions that we've answered help us come to a decision as to how we're going to do that component of our marketing. You know? So the modern consumer, they're making a lot of their decisions based upon video, not just not just Zennials, not just Gen Z, everybody, right? Um, whether it's video reviews, YouTube videos, reels, whatever it may be. How important does video come into play? Like, like you're talking about people that do natural language queries. Like people do not go to Google anymore and search for zit pad, uh, oxy pad zit. They said, how do I pop this zit, right? How do I get rid of the zit? Typically what comes up when people do those searches, YouTube results, right? So how important would you say videos are to this overall, to the overall concept, right, of, of, of defining that brand narrative, then also to the work that you're doing with the brands that you're working with. Well, certainly it's a, it's a large part of what we do. You know, I think um, in addition to helping our brands get their story straight, we help them tell them interestingly. And, um, you know, yeah, you can definitely, particularly like, example, work with brand for Procter & Gamble, King C. Gillette. It's a beard care brand. And the fact of the matter is like a lot of guys started to grow beards during the pandemic. But having a great beard, there's there's actually quite a lot to it. You know, you gotta know how to trim it, you gotta know how to shape it, you gotta know how to keep it your skin dry, or excuse me, from getting dry underneath there. There's all these products that you need. Um, and so there actually is quite a lot of education. Most guys go to YouTube, it's, you, you know, to figure this stuff out. So we help them create, we partner with, uh, kind of celebrity barbers from all across the country, uh, to answer the most pressing questions and to use King C. Gillette in a beard care routine it was le- legitimately answering those questions that guys had. So as just one example you know, video can be a, a crazy powerful way uh, to to educate a, as well as entertain, um, to do the content marketing, and and hopefully to you know kind of get your consumer from where they are to where you where they want to go. So absolutely, you know, if you can afford it and you can pull it off, um, videos video is a great way to go. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back after this brief message from our sponsor. Stay with us. How is AI impacting content and SEO? How will ChatGPT affect your world? Get answers, insights, and stay up to date on the ever-evolving world of search. Subscribe today at searchenginejournal.com slash subscribe. Now back to our show. If you can afford it, right? That's why when you're pitching your video concept, you have to get into the passion, what the world needs, what it's good at. And then... Yeah. Price. It's ex- it's expensive to go to market. I think um, it's just it is it, it costs money to to be a business and to be in business. And I think with the proliferation of you know you were kind of rattling these off at the beginning, all the different formats and stuff like that. If you think from that perspective, I mean, it can be busy and intimidating and like creating all this content. You're going, oh my god hopefully walking through this process starts to identify like not every brand needs to do every form of content. You couldn't if you wanted to, but hopefully identifying sort of, you know, your, your, your passion, what you're good at, um, what the world needs what they can pay you for along the way you're answering, like, well, where are they looking? Uh, how am I going to reach them? You know, King C. Bled is an example, right? That's a beard care brand brand for, for, largely for men uh, and so you start to kind of close in on like the, the content consumption habits of that consumer are different than we work with always or coca-cola or um, so that that starts to guide you to where you should be and what kind of content you might choose to tell your story i like that you don't have to produce every single type of content around your brand right just find out what Customers are looking for what they what what gets them going, and you can you can master one form of content, and then to a degree, you had brought up ChatGPT earlier. 
then you can scale out the ability to turn that video into a blog post or turn this into that or turn this into that or like do, do your social blasting or whatever. But the ability to master that one piece of content, um, gosh, I can't remember his last name. First name was Chris, but he did Beard Club for Men. And it came out with this crazy video where he's just walking around stroking his beard and there's a lion in the background. There's a library and a car goes by and everything else. Video went viral. Then they're known for that. Then they open up a video production company for brands as well because their original video had done so had, had been so crazy at the time right yeah. so, but, and be, uh, i don't even think they they had a blog right so it was just like one of those things where mastering that one component that that resonates that has has the virality to it that can really take off can be exactly what you need because you're right going to market is not cheap and it's nice to have that revenue coming in to pay for any of the other marketing experiments you might want to pull off the one everyone wanted forever was like, give me that out of shave club treatment, you know, where it was like, uh, they did that video for something like $15,000, but the guy that started the company had worked in advertising and marketing. And that's like, um, it's like, oh, well, you know, I think we need a grand slam home run. Can you give us a grand slam home run? It's, it's very hard to do. Real marketing is just like day in and day out, testing, learning, tweaking. Very few brands are going to be able to hit some brand stem home run, especially these days, um, and just be like, well, that's it. We're another unicorn now. You know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's an irresponsible thing to promise, but it's a very enticing offer to make, which is why, again, when you go to Instagram and you see all these, companies on there telling you like download my, my white paper for five hundred dollars and i'll tell you how to turn your marketing budget into a billion dollars it's like it just preys on what you want to happen pretty unlikely exactly exactly um we'll get you a thousand agency leads third days and you can turn them like really to pay some like private helicopters you'll be on your own by the end of the week yes. it's like yeah. come on man and they're driving these bodies and shit. It's like, dude, come on. Well, Ryan Kutcher, it's been a great uh, conversation. Uh, really enjoyed talking branding with you, um, talking the icky guy system, and just overall talking marketing. Sometimes just get away from the 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 weeds from an SEO perspective. Look at the yeah. a lot of us that are in certain working on everything. Else so really appreciate your insight where can folks find you online yeah uh you can email me uh ways maybe email is a, is, a, is a tough way to go you can go to circuitmaximus.com uh you can find me ryan kutcher at ryan kutcher on instagram uh and certainly on linkedin ryan kutcher a-u-t-s-c-h-e-r um slick red guy in a hat Yep. I mean, you're as far as you are right now. Ryan, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Again, it's been a great conversation. Uh, and I, we're going to be, for those of you that are listening uh, or watching, we're going to be recapping this on Search Engine Journal uh, with show notes, tips, and takeaways. All from Ryan Kutcher at Circus Maximus. Thank you again. Really appreciate you dropping by. Lauren, thank you. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. All right, have a good one. Yeah.